from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 174, recorded on July 29th, 2019. Vincent Racaniello and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. What's the temperature out, Dixon? It's about 88. I would say right now it's 88. Also joining us from a remote location. <laughs> Somewhere on Long Island. <laughs> Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hey, Daniel. Is it warm out there? You know, it, it has been so hot recently. It's been um, over 100 degrees, and uh, today it has dropped down um, into the 90s. So a balmy it feels, 90. It, it, it's balmy. <laughs> it's, but no, I was out a little bit earlier, and it's like walking through soup. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what it is. Pea not, soup? I'm not, we, we always say that, but I'm trying to think of, like, who who's ever walked through soup? What's the reference <laughs> there? <laughs> like, you know, it just reminds me of that time. The I Campbell Soup Kids, soup. probably, but uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> It's crazy. If you like this podcast, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a link for you. If you would like to see Kevin's a year's worth of TWIP, you can go to his website. We'll put it in the, what do you call them, show notes? Show notes. But I'm going to read it now, magcloud.com slash browse slash issue Slash one six zero seven one eight eight. I'd I'd like to qualify this though because I know what this is, and I'm not meaning this in a pejorative way at all. This is Kevin's contribution to TWIP over the year. This is not the entire TWIP. It's just Kevin's contribution. Yeah, it's fine. He can call it. It is. No, that's fine. I'm. I have no quibbles with it whatsoever. I'm thrilled every time he writes. Very nice. We could call it. We call it Kevin's year. Kevin's year. Right. Kevin is absent from this. <laughs> Kevin is absent from this. this was, he did not write in. Maybe he's on vacation. I'm going to write him an email right now. <laughs> what what <gasps> happened? And while you're telling us about last week's case, right, Daniel? Okay, let me uh, let me remind everyone who is tuning back in and uh, tell the story for the first time. For those of you who are tuning in for the first time, the case I presented uh, last TWIP was a case of a, um, I described it, him as a successful individual. It's actually a physician, a well-known, accomplished physician in the New York area. <laughs> uh, and he, his story was that he had been having epigastric pain, so pain in the upper central part of his abdomen, of his belly, uh, for about nine months, sort of waxing and waning in intensity. Uh, finally, in the workup, uh, some of my colleagues, gastroenterologists, did an upper endoscopy. And when they got to the stomach, they visualized several small, mobile, white, serpiginous um, moving objects, I think I described them as a little on the chubby side, the objects, not my colleagues. Um, and the calipers that we're using for reference are about 2.8 millimeters. So these objects were, you know, the same scale as the 2.8 millimeter um, uh, device that they were using to um, – the four steps using to grab them. They, um, I asked him a little bit more. Uh, I was able to see the footage of this, uh, but one of them was actually seen trying to burrow into the gastric mucosa. They're able to grab one of these um, wriggly little guys and uh, sent it to the parasitology laboratory for identification. And when we searched through um, the history, the, the one thing that was curious was that this individual had a habit of I said, curing his own protein sources, which included uh, meats, fishes, things like that. Right. Curing his own protein. That could be a title. Yeah. He was a doctor, <laughs> so those they must have been sick, and then he gave them some medicine. And then well, that's were... what I thought. <laughs> but, well, what malady could they be suffering from? Exactly. Maybe, exactly. maybe we know. <laughs> maybe he had not cured them. That's right. Dixon, yes. take that first email. Please. I will. Till writes, Dear Professors Twip, after a longer time of absence in writing, I'm finally writing with another case guest. The presentation of the worms found in the stomach, 
white burrowing in the stomach wall immediately brings to mind anasychiasis, caused by the nematode anasechus simplex. These worms, that can be acquired through the consumption of raw or undercooked seafood, try to burrow through the stomach wall, which they are unable to pass, causing pain and a local eosinophilic reaction. Two things, however, do not fit with the suspected diagnosis. First of all, the larvae of anasechus are typically bigger, around two centimeters in length. Maybe the case description was referring to 2.8 millimeter in diameter and not in length, or maybe it was supposed to mean 2.8 centimeters. The stomach, no, no, I'm sorry. The second obstacle in the diagnosis is the timing. Anasychiasis is typically an acute infection with symptoms occurring only hours after ingestion of the raw fish or seafood. However, there have been rare reports of extended periods of symptoms following the dislocation of parasites in the small or even large intestine. Um, there's a parenthesis 1.2, whatever that refers to. So either there was a low-grade infection that has been going on for some time, or the patient is especially indolent and suffered repeated exposures of acute anasychiasis infections after ingestion of his self-made foods. On another matter, I wanted to ask how far Vincent has come with the overseas mailing of these signed PD-6 copies. I ventured guesses in the, in the past and was lucky enough to win TWIP-162 in December of 2018. However, I still did not receive the long-awaited book. I'm sorry to bother you with this, but I just wanted to make sure that you didn't ship it months ago and it got lost on the way. I attached my address below just in case. Please give up the great work. New episodes of your podcasts are always a highlight. All the best, Till. It's coming, Till. I haven't sent it yet. Okay. It's in the Till. It will be there. It will be there. Daniel, can you take the next one? <laughs> Certainly. Eric writes, hello, Twippy Decker. Twippy Decker hosts. Twipple. <laughs> Twipple. Twipple. Twipple, Twipple, Twipple Decker. Decker hosts. Okay. <laughs> Twipple Decker. I've just listened to this week's episode, and I feel compelled to offer a guess for the case of the week. Mm -hmm. The symptoms from this case remind me very much of a previous case, I think from episode 93, A Fishy Tale Unfolds in which the individual experienced severe gastric pain shortly after consuming sushi. In this case, the culprit was the anisakis worm. What gave me pause about this week's case was the chronic nature of the symptoms described. Anisakiasis is quite an acute ailment which can occur within hours of consuming contaminated raw or undercooked seafood and is the result of the anisakis worms crawling out of the contaminated meat and attempting to burrow into the lining of the stomach. The patient's chronic symptoms made me doubt Anasakis until Dixon proposed that uh -oh. the individual might be continually and unknowingly reinfecting himself with the meat preserving practice. It could be that he eats the preserved and contaminated meat regularly and never drew the connection between the stomach pain and the meat. Mm -hmm. The other thing that seemed off is that the worms that Daniel described seeing in the stomach were only a few millimeters long. Mm -hmm. Anasakis worms can be as long as two centimeters when uncoiled. Could it be that these worms just happen to be somewhat smaller than the average? Overall, I think anisakiasis is the diagnosis I would give, even though there were a couple irregularities from what I've read in a typical case. Although humans are a dead-end host for this worm and won't survive for long, they can be treated with albendazole. Best, Eric. Mm -hmm. Ben writes, Dear Twiploid Organisms. That's very cool. I've thought long and hard about this week's case, and I just cannot come up with an answer that I'm happy with. <laughs> My not-so-short list included Diphilobothrium latum, Trichinella spiralis, Paragonima, Strongyloides, Ancelostoma, and a few others. <laughs> all fit part of the description, but not all of it. I will therefore concede defeat this week. <laughs> Be glad I am not making real diagnostic decisions for this man and excitedly await the outcome. Hmm. Just wanted to add an interesting point in some of the things you covered in TWIP 173 with the idea of using RNA interference to try and characterize the Matryoshka virus. P. vivax can't be grown in continuous culture. So that would make doing genetic studies difficult anyway. But if P. nolzi or P. falciparum, which can be cultured, could be infected with the virus, hmm. plasmodium parasites lack RNAi machinery. They don't have hom homologs to Drosia or Argonaut or any of the RNAi genes, and some had hypothesized that this potentially meant 
they didn't have viruses because of the key role of RNAi in antiviral immunity. This is exactly the reason I'm doing gene knockdown experiments with a glucosamine-inducible ribozyme system. Hmm. Plasmodium parasites also don't undergo non-homologous end joining when they get a double-stranded DNA break and always need a repair template, which can make CRISPR-Cas9 gene knockouts more difficult. All bundled up with a genome that has a primer design <laughs> nightmare, including right. 81% AT content. I'm therefore convinced that plasmodium has evolved to be difficult to work on in the lab, <laughs> thus increasing its fitness by making it harder to develop anti-plasmodial therapies. Right. Winter back in Australia today means today is 19 Celsius and blue sky. Sounds like he might be at the Walter and Eliza Hall. I wonder if he is. Uh, he's in the University of Adelaide. He's the University of Adelaide, eh? He has oh. a few papers, suggestions, bad, bad news for our current antimalarial drugs. The mm-hmm. authors discover artemisinin resistance in Papua New Guinea, which has a very high prevalence of malaria. Right. And treating malaria parasites with certain antibiotics kills parasites in the replication cycle after treatment in a phenomenon called delayed death. Mm-hmm. The authors uncover the molecular basis for delayed death. Indeed. Delayed death in the par- parasite Plasmodium falciparum is caused by disruption of prenylation dependent intracellular trafficking. Hey, didn't hey, we could delay our own deaths like that? Prenylation <laughs> dependent. Prenylation is a lipid, isn't it? Wow. Shades of our paper. We've got lipids on the head right now, or on the mind, I should say. Dixon. Here I go. Sue Ellen writes, Wow, <clears throat> I learned a lot from making the wrong diagnosis of our patient in TWIP 172, the retired physician with the bad stomach cramps and rash on his torso. To paraphrase the old medical saying goes, I heard hoofbeats and thought zebras instead of horses. And as a horsewoman myself, I should know better, ha ha ha, in choosing between B. coli and E. histolytica, I chose the less widespread of the two. It really did not occur to me to even think about which was more likely to be infecting our patient. So now I've added that to my differential diagnosis notes. Also, that rash, instead of the digging deeper to try to find something besides a parasite that might have caused it, I sort of ignored it, which is why it's really probably a good thing I'm not a real medical doctor. (laughs) Now I've noted that Salmonella typhi not only can cause a rash— but it certainly is something to look for when trying to complete a diagnosis, since curing the patient's eustolytica, only to have him die of salmonella poisoning would not be a good outcome. As for this week's case, I did have a possible diagnosis in my head as soon as I heard the case. I am thinking trichinellosis from Dr. Depommier's favorite parasite, Trichinella spiralis. From the CDC's info on trichinellosis, curing, salt, drying, smoking, or microwaving meat alone does not consistently kill infective worms. Homemade jerky and sausage were the cause of many cases of trichinellosis reported to CDC in recent years. And from the PD7th edition, currently prevalence of trichinellosis is no low within the United States, occurring mostly as scattered outbreaks, less often involving pork consumption and more often involving poorly cooked game, with the majority of human cases being due to trichinella spiralis and T. murelli. Also from PD-7, treatment is commonly mebendazole or albendazole. Keep the great cases coming, doctors. Swellen in Roswell, Georgia. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Hum is right. I think we only have two people who are in the running for a book. We do, so it's a 50-50. <laughs> because I think Ben won one. Ben won no, one? No, probably not. He's in Australia, right? He is, Yeah. He's going to have to wait along with Till if we have to send him one, though, I can tell you that. Let me, while you guys are discussing, let me search. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. Well, let's think Till, Till got one. Um, Till got one, Su- sure. Sue Ellen won one. Sue Ellen, past, I think I she did. I, I Sue Ellen did, name. yeah, you're right. She okay. Did. So it's, now you're going to ask what we would think. Is that correct, Daniel? Uh, that that you know that is the usual script. I've got it written here. Oh, now ask what Dixon, <laughs> and, right. then, and then we take turns on who gets to go first. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say Vincent. What do you think? Uh, well, I think it's anisakiasis because he eats this. Uh, what is it? Cured salmon meats. 
Did he say? Short, short, short didn't, say didn't, didn't say. Didn't say. Didn't well, say. Well, I mean, I just know from the previous case, this young lady ate sushi, and an hour later, with pains in her stomach, they did an endoscope, an and they saw the worms burrowing into her stomach wall. Remember, this guy has had this condition for nine months. Chronicity is a problem. And he's a doctor. Well, doctors doctor. ignore their issues. You know that. Yeah, but this would be hard to ignore. The anisakis pain would be hard to ignore. Oh. I have another suggestion. Trichinella? No, 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 no. No, no, you're not finished, though. I didn't mean to. No, I said anisakiasis was my guess That's just it. because right. of the looking at the worms in the stomach. I'm going to go down a different path here. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm going to request a microscopic look at these small objects. Because what I'm thinking here is that they're not anisakis at all, but rather they're the newly hatched eggs of flies that are invading his cured meats. So he might be suffering from epigastric pain due to myiasis, mm -hmm. which is caused by... The bot fly? Bot, no, not just bot flies. Uh, house flies of various kinds that might lay their eggs on really? his not-so-cured well, meat products. And then he might eat them, and then he gets these. These are very small compared to the Anasekis worms. These so they're maggots. They're maggots. They're this first stage maggots. And that's my guess. Burrow into his stomach. No, they won't. They won't. They they try, but they don't succeed. But they they don't. They're not as aggressive as anisakiasis. If I had stomach pain like that for months, I'd do I'd something. Go to about a doctor. <laughs> Why would he do that? He's a doctor. But um, you know, cure thyself, physician. I forget what line that's from. It's a Shakespearean quote, I think. But that's an interesting idea. Dick. So that's that. You know, upon listening to all of the caveats that all of, that both of these people wrote about. So, but they still stuck with the one they knew. Yeah, right? me not too. with the one they didn't know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go down a different road. I want to see the microscopic examination because these, if they're maggots, they will be segmented. Okay, mm -hmm. and if they're nematodes, they won't be segmented. So Daniel, can you give us okay. a report from the lab? Sure, sure. <clears throat> so the um, so fortunately we were able to obtain one. It went off to the parasitology lab where it came back as non-segmented anisacid species. Non-segmented. Okay, fine. So so tell okay. me. Ta so but this is good. So yeah, now let's try to explain this, right? Because you know I got called. This was you know sort of live case, right? You know, here this is going on, what's going on, you know. And so, you know, a lot of the same things that our emailers brought up for me were, you know, so one was nine months, that's not typical. So let, no. we're gonna have to come up with an explanation now that we actually have the parasitology lab confirmation. Um, second, what about size, right? These guys are supposed to be, you know, I've, not only have we read the textbook, but we've written it. <laughs> They're supposed to be bigger. <laughs> now we don't even believe our own words. <laughs> No, but you know, if it's non-segmented, that's that's the clue. That 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 would have got me right back to the nematode stories. Um, and there are many different species of anisakid. Okay, that's a general term. It's not a, a specific term. It's a ascaris-like nematode that infects cetaceans mainly. And so um, there are tons of different species of them, not just anisaca simplex. There's there's a Terra Nova species. We have a, a big table in uh, the book for um, aberrant nematode infections. And as part of that table, you can see some of the names of these organisms. We don't know their life cycles very well because it's very difficult to study marine transmitted uh, parasites where fish are the intermediate hosts and the cetaceans are the definitive hosts. So, you know, seeing first stage any of these other species, I've never seen them, so I can't really say how big they should be. But as long as it's not segmented, then I will take back what I said and go with the nematode story. <laughs> yeah, because you don't have a choice. You, you know, at that point, yeah, that was the whole. You point. need more data. See, if he had told you that, you would have gotten it right. Exactly. Right? Exactly. This way, it was a little more interesting. Yeah. Right. But what about the size, Daniel? Um. You know, th that's an interesting issue. And, and as um, Dixon brings up here, um, the report came back that it was, you know, anisocket species. And as mentioned, there there are multiple species in addition to simplex, um, you know, this peg graphy and typica and xiphoderum, and there's a whole bunch. And they, they range in size. And also, um, you know, as mentioned, we're looking at the forceps, and the forceps is about 2.8 millimeters, and they're roughly the same size as that. Um, I'm not sure if this was actually coming from 
a fish or a krell or some other exactly. marine species. And so exactly. the 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 classic case that we think of is someone eats salmon, right? That's, you know, it's or or a larger fish that has a simplex. And these are going to be larger. The pain is going to be acute and severe. Right. So the whole story, like trying to explain the chronicity suggests that this is a smaller, you know, less traumatic. Well known. Right. Yeah, That's right. and I, and I think also that two interesting things. One is this nine month chronicity um, with the life cycle that we know of the Anasaka species means he was repeatedly infecting himself. Of course he was. And then once the diagnosis was made, he was made aware of this. Um, you know, now he can stop. You know, <laughs> ingesting these. Well, and so my understanding is yeah. since since he was given this bit of information, right. um, this cycle has been interrupted, and he's doing much better. Yeah. So. In- the original outbreaks that really alerted the world to the fact that this might be a problem happened back in the 1960s when, uh, in Holland particularly, selling um, brined green herring. That was the source of the original infections. And they, was, they would eat them practically raw. I mean, they would catch them, throw them in some brine to kill them, basically, but they you know, they were as fresh as they were caught, basically. And then they would have these little carts that would go into the streets of Amsterdam and Rotterdam and places like that. And they would disappear. I mean, they were delicious, right? With a nice Heineken or an Amstel. Fantastic way to spend the summer. And people immediately would react. To, oh, I've got this horrible pain in my stomach. And they would go off to the hospital. They didn't know what was causing it. So I actually knew the person who became the um, director of aberrant infections for the, uh, the the FD, I believe it was the FDA. His name was George Jackson. And I, and I went to work with him first when I got to Rockefeller as a postdoc. And he, he became the world's expert on these kinds of infections and was very instrumental in food inspection. And then they discovered that if you flash freeze these green herring in liquid nitrogen and thaw them out immediately, it, it kills the worms, but the flesh of the fish is as fresh as it was if you had just caught it. So that became a curative, basically, no pun intended, because of this guy's habit of, I don't know how he cured the fish, but he certainly didn't cure them long enough or well enough to kill off these worms. Um, and he spent the rest of his life, George Jackson spent the rest of his life in Washington, D.C., looking the Food and Drug Administration, that's who he worked with. He was in charge of uh, aberrant nematode infections. As, a, as a, They thought it was going to be an epidemic that was, would not go away, but in fact it has. So, interesting um, sequelae. Did you ever find out what the source of the infection was? Uh, we believe it was fish. Yeah, which sort. fish? Which we, fish we, don't, we don't know. And again, you know, it's the patient confidentiality. There's a lot of information <laughs> going back from my direction and not a lot of, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, a l- little bit of head nodding and okay, this yeah, is all. Exactly. <laughs> so, the, you know, when you think <laughs> about you got all you need to know. <laughs> when you think about how the fish acquire it from the definitive hosts, like, like say a whale or a dolphin, or a, a pinniped, which is a, a seal, uh, the eggs of the ascarid are being shed in the uh, water column. <laughs> and the fish will filter them out, all right? And they will hatch then in the fish. So these, these could actually be first or second stage larvae of freshly caught fish, not third stage, which the anisakids larvae usually are. They're usually larger. And that's the infective stage for the next host. Mm-hmm. So you could have mm-hmm. intermediate stages as well. That's what yeah, I was wondering about. about that with the size because the L2s right? are going to be more in this range. But then the or story of it trying to burrow into the gastric mucosa, yeah. that, that seems like L3 behavior. But It does. I, I, agree. I agree. But they didn't succeed, right? I mean, they were just… I don't know. Half interested, maybe. I don't know. I guess they should. I should say, did you watch? Did you give it a chance? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, go back and try to penetrate more. Yeah. You just didn't get it right. <laughs> Yeah, but then, and but then, the other thing then, is with a smaller worm, you would get less of a symptom, right? Well, that that's why it made sense to me that this was a species with smaller larvae yeah, than yeah. The, the classic ones that are, are exactly. described. Exactly. Um, you know, but the nice thing is this gentleman now, you know, the story was put together and, and he, he is not going to suffer any longer. Why is he not suffering? Well, he's no longer going to be consuming this source right. of... So you told him I, not to do that, yes. Yes. Why isn't the smoking killing the worms? So well, there's two. There's Depends two. Features. How we did it. I mean, yeah. There's two features here, Dixon and jumping. So the first is the issue of, you know, you you 
you kill, let's say you kill a fish, right? You're, you're fishing in Alaska and you catch your king salmon and you immediately just start eating the thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this big right? mistake, big mistake. <laughs> or, or, and I'm going to give, I'm going to throw this out. Or you're like, well, why don't we just put it here on the bank and we'll eat it in a couple hours? Like what would be like, what would be a better option? Wait a couple hours or oh, just start eating it right the away? The best thing to Wait, do when you freeze catch it. a fish that you're going to eat <laughs> is to it. clean it yeah. immediately, no matter what. And I'm going to tell you that all of these intermediate stages for these parasites are in the gut tract of the fish. And the reason why their um, mm. the green herring was actually involved in this is because they would put them on ice, but they wouldn't clean them. Of course, none of them were cleaned. They were whole fish. You know, they're about yeah, a little yeah. bigger than a sardine. but And they crawl you, out of the intestine. Yeah, that's right, into the meat. And if you catch a fish of the size of a king salmon, which could be up to 50 pounds – the first thing you should do is drag it on shore, kill it, and then clean the fish. And that will eliminate any possibility of larvae. So you cut it. the head off, you, know, you slice open that. the gut, and out spills everything. Right? Yeah. It's very just, simple, right? Or just, I usually just throw the intestines back in the river and feed the the bottom yeah. feeders of whatever they are, crayfish and things like that. But uh, Yeah, that was where I was trying to prompt with that, is that these are in the intestinal tract, and then right. upon death, they migrate into the muscles. So Yeah, freshly killed um, fish that are cleaned are safe. Yeah. So you got it. So one is you got to avoid that gap, which allows them to get into the muscle. And then second, um, you have to cure them in a certain way that will prevent these from then continue to be alive. And so we have exactly. a bunch of different um, methods. One is the liquid nitrogen, right. which is felt to maintain the best texture of the fish. Exactly. Um, you can actually put them in a freezer for, you know, the certain temperatures, certain periods of time. Um, you can kill them that way. Um, the just just smoking them, just brining them, you sort of might not succeed that way. So you may want to do something right. to. Now, you know. was he was he sad that he can't have his smoked meats anymore? <laughs> well, you could have smoked beef, you could have smoked pork, you could have smoked chicken, but not smoked fish. I mean, if you don't right. smoke the fish, right? All right. And Daniel, does if he could deal with the pain, is there any other downside of having repeated? Worms burrowing into his stomach wall. You know, not you know, you know, not really. Okay, okay. <laughs> not really. It's, it's more of an aesthetic issue. Got it. All right. So we did not have a, an email from Kevin. We did not. So I emailed him and he answered. Oh, should I read it? Sure. Kevin writes: Twip has blindsided me with such quick turnaround from the last episode. <laughs> Really? This is quick? <laughs> the wormy answer is still maturing in my brain like a larval nematode. Uh-oh. My initial thoughts on hearing the case of the two millimeter long gastric worms was some kind of nematode or less likely a dipterin larva, myiasis, uh -huh. though that is unlikely. Also could be a nematode that is not adapted to a human host and is just hanging out for a while. Anyway, sorry for such a larval reply. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to listening. I will up my game for the next episode episode midnight oil etc cool. etc does he know that he's now been shouted out on our website <laughs> I assume he's listened from the beginning yes good I, I did put the link in the website also great yeah so uh, there is one parasite in salmon that you would uh, miss eliminating by just cleaning the fish though because they can have the larval tapeworm in their muscle tissue already, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you can catch that by eating them, you know, undercooked or yeah, raw, yeah. basically. So, just thought I'd add that. All right, very good. Mm -hmm. All right, now before we, we move on, we have to pick a winner, right? Oh, let's pick a winner. There are only two. Two. Yeah, I mean, from what I could tell, Ben has not won one. Ben is in Australia, right? And Eric, I right. think, has not won one. I want to get so two. let's go. Uh, between a generated number between one and two, <laughs> number one. I'll think really high. <laughs> number one. one. Or two. So it's number one. It's Eric, I think. Eric, let me write down next to it. Eric is the winner. It's the the triple decker. Uh, Eric, please send your address, twip at microbe.tv, and we'll send you a copy of PD6 autographed by Dixon and Daniel. Right. Before we go to the paper, I wanted to mention, uh, Daniel, I sent you a book. I don't know if you got it yet. <clears throat> I just got it today. A beautiful hardcover. Right. So, Bit, Bitten. A, a young lady has written a book called Bitten. Bitten. It's a history of the right. use of ticks in the U.S. for biological warfare. 
and she really? wanted to know if she could come on the show and discuss it. So I said, send us the book. She sent us three copies. I'll bring yours in, Dixon. Thank you. So take a look over the next few weeks, and we'll get her on. How far back was that? Whether We were thinking of using Tix as weapons. World, World War II. Really? So she said she's accumulated a lot of evidence. It's in the book. It's funny. She's at Stanford. She actually works at Stanford. She's a yeah. science communicator. Really? And uh, so I was out there a couple of weeks ago, and she said, oh, why don't you come by? I'll show you my evidence room. <laughs> Gee whiz. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but I didn't have a chance to stop by. Her, na- her name is Chris Newby. Interesting. So read it, guys. And um, All right. when you're done, let me know, and we'll have her on. Right? That'd be fun. Why not? Something different. Something very different. Bitten. Sounds great. Bitten. It's a nice little hardcover book, isn't it, Daniel? Huh. I'm looking forward to reading it. Who published it? I, I should, uh, I'll tell a little side story here. Um, this was a number of years back, and I was taking care of an individual, and it was one of these complex cases where he had fever, and we we're called in, you know, trying to figure out what's going on, and he took me aside, and he said, well, I don't know if it's relevant, uh, but he told me the story. I, I don't know if people are aware, but the United States used to do quite a bit of biological warfare research uh, down, was it Fort well, U.S. Amred, right? So Fort Detrick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, uh, again, I believe it was under Nixon where we decided that we were no longer going to do mm-hmm. biological warfare research right. on on U.S. soil, apparently, it says in like the fine print. <laughs> mm-hmm. So this gentleman explained that he then was relocated to a site in Germany where <laughs> warfare research was continued not on U.S. soil. Right, we mm. obey the letter and of the law. Oh, so, yeah, so it was sort of interesting. It, um, anyway, <laughs> I'll leave it there. Whether or not that was relevant to his presentation at the time, um, but yeah, it, sort of interesting. Our paper was suggested by Justin. Justin who, was very. Um, he said, "Pretty neat stuff, especially since I have stuff. two cats." Because the original article in Science Magazine News. Uh, the headline is, cats may no longer be needed for toxoplasmosis research. Mm. T- scientists were angered and dumbfounded recently when the U.S. government, under pressure from animal rights activists, shut oh, down the right. world's leading hub for the study of toxoplasma. Right, right. I already do remember They use cats. But that. this paper s- suggests that you might not need to use them. But my, in my opinion, it suggests that we could populate the world with toxo-resistant cats. What do you think of that? I, that would be great. We if could we genetically could... alter cats so they no longer produce the, the sexual uh, phases in their intestine and put them out there and let them reproduce. What do you think of that? That'd be marvelous. And then, but I, you know, <laughs> I was going to say, but it, but it has to be all feline species, right? So we have to like genetically modify, you know, the lions and the tigers and and no, not that's, the bears. That's uh, too important. In that's the, true. I didn't think of them. Most of the Western world. That's but not, at least our house cats. Like if you think cats. about, yeah, yeah if you think right. about pet cats in in parts of the world, you could, exactly. you know, exactly. Which right. cat? Which felines have the burden of toxoplasma? Domestic cats. Probably there are billions of them, right? There are billions and feral cats too. And there's just like 10 lions left in the world, right? <laughs> More than that, but they're all in Africa. What other, and in zoos. What, other, in fel- zoos. what zoos. other felines are there? Oh, there are panthers and leopards and uh, jaguars and civets. And cougar? Cougar. Civets. Really? Yeah. Wow. All right, this paper Did is I say in, civets? Um, I think I meant – did I? Are, are, are civets felines? I don't, I don't actually know. That. I thought they were like in the badger species. I, I but misspoke. I misspoke. I don't think civets are, are felines. I don't think so. No, I think you're right. They're more related to raccoons and things like that. They um, are, they are um, related to raccoons. Yeah. I, I, I didn't mean that. I take it back. Civet cat is an imprecise term used for a variety of cat-like yeah, creatures. Exactly right. Exactly. They, they move like cats, but they're not really cats. Huh. But there's a ton of felines that are smaller – uh, that have some of them have very long long ears that they use to yeah. echolocate with almost. And uh, you're not a feline. No, I'm not. A feline. This paper is in BioArchive, which means it's been submitted somewhere. Right. But it is so fascinating. I think it's well done. I do too. Intestinal delta six desaturase activity determines host range 
for toxoplasma sexual reproduction. Did you know that there was an enzyme called delta-60 saturase? Because I didn't. No, of course not. I had no idea. I didn't know that. But, you know, there are only 20-some thousand proteins in the human, exactly. code in the genome. So exactly. you can't know all of them. You might. There are people that could actually remember those. Yes. Well, if you worked on lipids, you would. We're right? not. We're not one of those people. This is from the University of Wisconsin Madison and the USDA, right? Which is in Beltsville. It is. Bruno Martorelli di Genova, Sarah Said that Wilson. So well, Sarah Wilson, J.P. Duby, and Laura Knoll. Yeah, Duby is the world's expert on coccidium parasites, and uh, how about that? He's at the USDA. Yeah, that's right. He was the one that was most outraged, I'm sure, when they banned cats for research because he was on the, some of the original papers that John Frankel, who discovered that the cat was the definitive host for uh, toxic. Okay. What does that mean, Dixon? Back in the 60s. definitive host? It harbors the sexual stages. It harbors the sexual stage. So right. why don't you review that for us before we get into this? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so this is an epicomplex, and it's related very closely to malaria. Right mm -hmm. and to uh, cryptosporidium, and to cyclospora. Those are all in the same group of apicomplexes. Um, they all have complicated life cycles, and they use similar but different uh, terminologies for each of the stages, which confuses because you know that they're homologous to the same things that are going on. But let's just say, f for the sake of discussion here, we're talking about only toxoplasma. So. In order to transmit toxoplasma from animal to animal, you have two choices. One is that you could just eat another animal that has it mm -hmm. in their tissues, and they're harboring what's called a pseudocyst, mm -hmm. and inside of which are the bradyzoites, like the Brady Bunch, good way to remember that, and they're dormant. They lie dormant uh, in these um, remnants of infected cells, basically, with an acellular coating on the inside mm -hmm. to protect the organism. The moment you eat that mm -hmm. and you release it in the gut tract if you're a mouse or a lemur or a a non-feline but a mammal a warm but a mammal. Animal. it's a mammal that's right it has to be a mammal the the bradyzoites are released into the gut tract and they can penetrate um epithelial cells in the gut and then they can continue to transform while they're there into the tachyzoite a tachyzoite is the replicative stage of this parasite. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. replicates, 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 and it can replicate in almost any cell. That's the beauty of this parasite. It can, it has no restrictions on cell types. This is an asexual cycle. It's an asexual cycle. It's just dividing, and it's right? haploid. It's haploid. The organism is haploid at this point, right? But it doesn't. It, it has no restrictions, so it can spread from one cell to the other. And in fact, the sixth edition of our parasitic disease textbook has on the cover a graphically represented infected macrophage with tachyzoites mm. spread out in a little rosette form. Okay. Are there always eight? Uh, yeah, I think there are actually. Mm. So <clears throat> that's each, because you have to eat them. You have to eat these. That's right. And if you do, this yeah. is a macrophage. Because you, cause you've ate them. A macrophage. Uh, I, I, I didn't do it well, eight, Dan. I got it. 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 I hope everyone else got it too. Seven, eight, nine, you know. That's right. That's why seven. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Six is afraid of seven. So each of these tachyzoites mm -hmm. can burst out of this remnant of a cell and infect another cell and then recreate this it could infection. Be eaten, but they will not spread unless they're eaten, right? Um, they can't move on their own. But They're, the poop of animals that's... No, 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 not poop. We're no. not getting there yet. We're not getting there no yet. No poop, okay. <clears throat> no poop, because if they are pooped out, uh, they don't have a way of surviving outside. That's what the sexual stage allows. So these Brady, are those Bradyzoites? Ta Tachyzoites, they will die in the poop. They would die. Okay. They would die. Uh, if the animal contains these pseudocysts and it dies, very shortly thereafter, they die too. All right. It has very short lifespan. However... There is an exception to this, and that is if a cat or a feline mm -hmm. eats a, a tachyzoite-infected mammal, like, say, a mouse or a vole, it acquires the infection, and it goes down to the small intestine, and out from the pseudocysts come the tachyzoites. But once they get inside the intestinal cells of the, of the small intestine, they don't transform to tachyzoites, most of them. They transform to the sexual stage. The macrogametocyte and the microgametocyte, just like in malaria. Now, one's a female and one's a male. 
And well, that's what they say they are. <clears throat> they have no male and female organs or anything like this. There's just one smaller than the other. And their job is to fuse together to form a zygote. They do that in the intestine. They do it in the intestine. Okay. That's correct. Now, when they do that, then they start the sexual stage of the life cycle. Mm-hmm. And as a result, they can form uh, an oocyst. And the oocyst, that's the same name as you would call for the cryptosporidium or cyclospora mm-hmm. infections as well. The oocyst, in fact, even exists in malaria. Okay. And inside of that are the infectious stages for an animal that might ingest it as it comes out in the poop mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. feline. Right. And that's another way of spreading the infection. And that's why they warn women who are pregnant not to, feed, not to uh, clean the cat litter while they're pregnant because if they acquire the infection accidentally through ingestion of contaminated food right. or water with these resistance stages now, the oocysts, they last a lot longer than these tachyzoites would last outside of a host, then that's the way this parasite survives the environment in order to transmit it. itself long-term. So this production of oocysts only occurs it's only in, in cats. feline intestines. Only in feline intestines, that's and correct. the asexual cycle, which you described before, can, can occur have every any, any mammal. Any mammal at all. In fact, mammals that don't even eat meat can catch this thing, right? Because they can become that? accidentally infected with water. For instance, mm-hmm. um, a waterborne infections are very common in some places, and uh, the otters that live in the ocean on the outside uh, near agricultural runoff sites are subjected to oocysts from cat feces all the time, mm. and they can actually swallow them and then get infected. So. It's a, okay. it's a almost a ubiquitous infection. So they, in this paper, they want to know why, why the sexual feline cycle feline is restricted to felines, in, t- right. in particular their intestines. I, I was gonna let me. I'm gonna jump in with Please. a little um, because we'll get our cat lovers will jump in and say <laughs> you know something here. But so so I was talking to a woman and basically saying you know listen you know it, it's not like you have to kill your cats when you get pregnant. Um, you know <laughs> there is a period of time it takes for the feces to come out of the cat with the with the oocysts before they become infective, and that takes at least 24 hours. We say sort of one to five days. There's a variability, days, you know, temperature, humidity, etc. So, so as long as you know, as long as your husband is cleaning the litter boxes every day, the you know the risk is not going to be so high that you know we need to kill all the cats. Right. And the husband replies with every day. Yeah, that's right. Those, that's right. I only clean those boxes <laughs> once a week. Exactly. Well, now they have are, automated cleaner. To- they have, you know, <laughs> super um, efficient uh, cat litter cleaners that are automated. I, I want to read the sentence in the in the paper itself that actually refers to that. It says, pregnant women are advised against handling cat litter as maternal infection with T. gondii can be transmitted to the fetus with potentially lethal outcomes. They actually state that right in the paper. Yeah, yeah. So, so have your have your have your non pregnant partner or caregiver or whoever they are uh, take care of those cat things. Exactly. But uh, no, there's there's ways of basically hygiene and avoiding this to minimize the risk. But um, it, it's devastating actually when a um, right. when a fetus becomes infected in utero. Um, so it's it's rare in this country, but it does happen. Um, and in fact, it <laughs> it happens so rarely that. The hydrocephaly, which is one of the sequelae of early acquisition of toxoplasma by the fetus that results in a horrible disfigurement later on and after they're born, um, was discovered right here at Columbia's uh, mm-hmm. Department of Pathology. Dr. Wolf was uh, the guy who actually came up with that. So what they do here, they make intestinal cells from cats. They put them in culture. Organoids. Right? Or, they make organoids from stem cells and they disperse them into intestinal cells. So they're polarized. They have tight junctions. Yep. And so they put, they put, well, they, they release parasites from mouse brain. Yes. Right? Yes. And then they use, the, what, what, would they, what would they be called, those parasites that they're- Well, the bradyzoites are inside the pseudocysts. Uh, so and then as soon as they come out, they, they transform so to that's tachyzoites. What put, that's what they're putting in these cells. They want to infect them with tachyzoites. And then they look, they incubate them for five days and look for the pre-sexual stage, which are merozoites, right? Yes. And they don't find very many. They do not. So this, even though this is from the cat intestine, something's missing. Something is missing. And so immediately you think, well, it must be soluble because it washed away. <laughs> 
We yeah, disperse the best. You know, when you read the. <laughs> when so you, they say recent yeah, what do they studies say? What have do they said say? that Kigande as, as sexual stages scavenge fatty acids. So they said, let's throw some fatty acids onto these cultures. They put oleic acid or linoleic acid. Right. And lo and behold, 35% <laughs> make merozoite stage markers when they have these uh, linoleic but not oleic acid. What a simple thing. Very simple. You can buy it from Sigma. <laughs> you can buy everything from Sigma. Linoleic acid. Right. But it's a requ- it's a, an absolute requirement for mammalian survival, by the way. You don't live without it. You don't live without linoleic acid? You do not. There are two essential fatty acids, and they're, those are the two. And where do you get it from, your diet? From diet, yeah. From diet. We don't make it. I don't think so. No, I, I concur with Dixon on this. Yeah. All right. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one out of ten isn't bad here. <laughs> so they, um, in these cultures, supplemented with linoleic acid. Right. They see round structures with... Uh, that react with a macrogamete protein. Right. And what is a macrogamete, Dixon? Well, it's one of the sexual stages one of the that sexual stages. occurs okay. after the tachyzoa transforms. It transforms either into a microgametocyte or a macrogametocyte. Right. Then they look for intracellular oocyst wall biogenesis. Right. That's another sexual stage, right? Yeah. And they see nine oocyst walls per centimeter squared of culture. <clears throat> Cat cells with linoleic acid, but none without... Linoleic. It's incredible. It's it's like night and day. But it's, you know what? Twenty micromolar doesn't work. You need two hundred micromolar. Right, right. To do it. Yeah. Okay. So why? That's a good question. Cats are the only mammal that lack delta six saturase activity, which is the rate uh, limiting step for converting linoleic acid to arachidonic acid for getting rid of it. In other words, right. right? Well, they don't get rid of it. They create something else. Yeah, but it. the linoleic is going to be gone if you have delta uh, that is six. That's absolutely right. But they say cats, oh, cats, felines, right? All, All felines, felines, including lions. and they don't have it. But not civets because they're not cats. Not civets, right. <laughs> Even though they're called civet cats. <laughs> linoleic acid is the dominant fatty acid in cat serum. It's 25 to 40 that's percent of the total fatty acid, whereas rodents only have 3 to 10%. Right. So they see... Must be that the lack of saturase in the cat allows for a buildup of linoleic acid, which somehow makes the sexual development go. Right. And this is um, not present in the mouse intestine. Doesn't it also, isn't it, I mean, you just finished another podcast here, didn't you? I did. What was it? Immune. No, I thought you were doing the uh, Evo. I'm sorry. I thought it was was immune. But you do the Evo, right? (laughs) I do two Evo. So the (laughs) evolution of cats. Yeah. Felines, all of them have this as their characteristic. That that's powerful biology. Yeah, they lack delta. Powerful six biology. So mice have delta six desaturase. They do. So they don't have linoleic acid. They're very low levels. Right. So they took mouse intestinal cells. Right. Infected them. Yep. In the presence of linoleic acid. Yeah. What do you think happened? Not. <laughs> oh no! If they added linoleic acid, I, they they would develop. Yeah, they get they see these markers of the uh, sexual stages. Right. The, when you add linoleic acid to mouse cells, but oleic acid had no effect whatsoever. Again, they also have an inhibitor of this enzyme, right? Which they can throw into the mouse cells, and they also get. Um, they can get more though. They get uh, sexual stages because that's right. you're that's producing right. linoleic acid. Correct. So you can either supplement or. Uh, add an inhibitor of the enzyme. Inhibit the destruction of. Uh, so this, of course, raises the possibility to study the sexual development of T. in the mouse intestine. As we speak, I bet they're doing these experiments. I'm sure they are. And that means you don't need cats anymore? You don't need cats anymore. But I think you ought to release the mice into the environment and make a new <laughs> reservoir for the development of sexual stages of T. don't you mm-hmm. think? That would be a great idea, Daniel. <laughs> That'd be horrible. <laughs> yeah. So basically, oh, you want to, you want to, yeah. No, no. For your for your model animal, I think the idea is here is to have a knockout, right? Of the yeah. Um, so that they can't actually um, take it down the pathway to racconite. I'm acid. sorry. Yes, lack of um, delta six. But, yes. but that would have another it, effect though, on their immune system, though, wouldn't it? Well, so here's the interesting thing is that they're not suggesting or, or well, I, I don't know if the work tells us at this point, but in their discussion, they talk about the issue about is this actually a nutritional or is this a signaling um, right. 
effect. And uh, and uh, there's toxoplasma, a toxoplasma. You mean? Yeah, yeah. So there's a yeah. whole oxylipin signaling system that has evolved in um, plant immune systems. And uh, you know, and as we realize, our AP complexion, you know, common ancestors going back away. And so this may be part of that system. And what it actually is doing is it's signaling that it's in the right environment to Mm -hmm. undergo, um, you know, this, this pathway versus another pathway. So. I mean, linoleic acid is a, an absolute requirement for mammalian life. So you, why don't cats have it then? Uh, cats do. Why don't they mice have, have very of, much of it? Why don't well, they mice? have some. They have enough for their own purposes. I guess. But they don't have enough for their so parasites. So cats have an excess because of this yeah. uh, enzyme That's deficiency. Right. Right. Exactly. So they also feed mice the uh, delta-6 saturase inhibitor. Right. And uh, that allows them to be infected orally and make the sexual stages. How about exactly. that? That's amazing. So that's a proof of concept that you can, as, as Daniel right. said, you that's can right. knock out their delta-6 right. saturase and make a model. Do you think... They will be careful not to let those mice out of the cages. <laughs> it's actually an, it's an actually an issue if you think about it because um, you know what why do cats have this? Was there an evolutionary um, you know advantage? And there may have been a coevolution between cats or cats and toxoplasmosis because it toxoplasmosis works for the cats, right? It improves their mm. ability to catch rodents because right the rodents end up being less averse to their smell of their urine, etc. So right, so cats that had um, that were lacking in this desaturase um, were more likely to be able to, well, may have been the only ones who could really actually effectively harbor toxo, spread it to the rodents and get into this wonderful cycle. So you're saying it helps them to catch food. I think it does. What mm-hmm. do you think, Dixon? Do you, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I because they don't show. I think the they data... don't show any. Yeah, they don't show any disease. Um, they tend to be doing well themselves. But if they could get it into the food system, into the rodents, yeah. so the cats in cats it doesn't cross the placenta. Or it, sure, it does. No, it does everything in cats that it doesn't in, in people. Does it or, cause defects in cat fetuses, but not in mice? So, Daniel, uh, what did you say? It doesn't affect them. Who were you referring to, cats or mice? Cats. When a cat, when a cat, you know, eats the eats the rodent, and you've got the um, the pseudocyst then going and going through the gut mm-hmm. uh, transformation. Um, cats, cats do fine. They they're not. But what sick, a, what about know. cat fetuses? Do they have ah, problems like true. human fetuses do if infected? I actually don't know about. Okay. I don't know about. I that. bet that's, it's that's been important. studied. I bet it's been studied, and I bet it's true that 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 has a similar effect on cat fetus fetal development as it does in humans. And other mammals as well, but cats are not always pregnant, right? Yeah, no, some of them are. And the male yeah. cats never get pregnant. <laughs> so at least half of the animals would have an advantage no matter what. They still have the infection, though, in the other way, too. They can catch uh, the bradyzoites, can transform to tachyzoites, and they can go on to replicate in cells. So they not only get the sexual stages in the gut tract, but they also get the other part of the infection as well. So they have pseudocysts in their own tissues. And if cats are eaten by something else, and that's not that infrequent in nature to have carcasses consumed immediately after they die, um, that could be another way for them to spread this infection as well. It's a ubiquitous infection, though, Vincent. It's in almost every mammal. It says that if your cat is immunosuppressed, they will have problems. Ah. I don't see anything about... Um, and, and by the way, converting linoleic acid to arachidonic acid and then to all of the eicosanoids, mm-hmm. all of those are important for the cascading effects of... Is that an innate immune response, Daniel, or is that acquired immunity? Which? No, I, those cascades are using arachidonic acid to go to uh, eicosanoids. It's innate. innate. It's innate, yeah, okay. it's still innate. Right. But still is a protection against some microbes. Not yeah, sure. I'm yeah. Not. It's like an anti-inflammatory kind of reaction. So the the eicosanoids are going to be like in um, your whole pathway where you have like your non-steroidals acting yeah. and things like that. So prostaglandins, tromboxane, right. prostacyclins, leukotrienes. So yeah, I would have said that. So if they feed, uh, if they <laughs> well, feed, you're gonna, you're gonna say that <laughs> in my sleep, <laughs> they feed mice uh, the inhibitor multiple times. They can get as many oses per gram. As exactly. the cats do, exactly. As the cats do, a hundred thousand. <laughs> that's incredible. That's 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 more than proof of concept. I mean, that's 
you've turned a mouse into a cat. That's what you. So that's the species barrier. This enzyme delta six desaturates. How remarkable! So uh, you know the species barrier for poliovirus in mice is neuraminic acid. No, no (laughs) poliovirus receptor. I'm trying. What, What is it? The poliovirus receptor. What is it? The poliovirus receptor. Does it receptor. not have another name? <laughs> I call it the poliovirus receptor. Yeah, I know because you worked on poliovirus. Because I found it and I called it the poliovirus receptor. What, does other, what do other people call I, it? I call it CD155, Dixon. Does that help? Yeah. So after we discovered it, people called it CD155. Oh, thank you. I, I but the, the poli- in mice, mice <laughs> given poliovirus, the virus will not replicate. However, if you add the human polio receptor sure, gene to mice, sure. which we did in our lab, they can be infected. That is the species barrier of, uh, to polio in mice. And when we made transgenic mice Aha. producing the polio receptor, Columbia made us put them in containment because <laughs> they were worried they would get out and spread a new reservoir of polio virus in the wild. Tell them people do it so much better. They're already out there. <laughs> so for many years, we had to breed, We I had to buy this containment device which cost a lot of money and i had to breed the mice in it and it was basically a plexiglass a huge plexiglass container and once the power failed and the blower went out and the mice almost all died because of that but anyway that's the same issue as here if you made knockout mice for delta-6 saturase you have to be careful not to let them go however i have to tell you that laboratory mice would not survive very long in the wild, no, they in my wouldn't. opinion, I, they're very debilitated. They're slow for the first. They're very, very slow. Nothing like a wild mouse. In they terms might be of speed. eaten by feral cats. Though they would be eaten by feral cats. That mm. wouldn't do anything. No, I would just pass it on to the cats through their their tech, their. Uh, so that's citizens. it. Isn't that cool? It's very cool. It's very cool. Very clean work. Very definitive. Uh, no doubt about the results, and. Uh, Wonder it's what, enabling. It's enabling too. It opens. It's seminal. It opens a new field. It does, can, and it solves a long-term mystery as to just why cats and nobody else. Yes. Love it. Love it. Okay, why cats and no one else? We we have to have a good title for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> a fat cat. That was our one possibility. Fat cat. Linoleic right. acid. This is the Garfield effect. <laughs> is Garfield a fat cat? A very fat cat. Loves yes. eating. Loves to eat. Dixon, do you have a hero? I do, but I don't have his biography with me, but I, I can almost tell What's you. his name? His name is William Traeger. I bet you if you looked it up on Wikipedia, you'd get a biography. I'm sure you would because he's a very famous, unfortunately he's passed away, um, malariologist that I had the pleasure of knowing while I was at Rockefeller for three years. Uh, and William Traeger was... You know where he was born? Where? He was born in, I think, New, New, Jer- New, New, New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah, New Jersey. And I think he went to Rutgers for his degree, his undergraduate degree, as I He recall. was Rutgers, then he moved to Harvard. That's right. Where he was the first graduate student of Cleveland. Ah. In his lab, he established a culture system for flagellate symbionts. Yeah, Cleveland was a protozoologist. That's right. He was very interested in... Um, all kinds of things. He was a. He wrote a wonderful book called Symbiology. He showed that the roach's ability to digest cellulose was due to the cellulases of the symbiotic flagellates. That's right, exactly. So the gut. He did termite research as well. After his PhD, he joined the lab of Rudolf Glaser, ah, in Princeton. So Glaser worked on soil nematodes. He developed a system for growing Borrelia, Borrelina. It's a virus ah. which causes disease in silkworm. Interesting. What well, Newark? Developed, and he also you know, developed a system to grow Aedes aegypti larvae in a, nu- in a nutrient medium. So here we see a a trend. He's developing methods for growing. He loved culturing things, and um, he loved culture too. He was a very, very cultured individual. You he, mind if I'm reading this? Uh, please. After World War during World War II, he served as a captain. Yep. Supervising clinical trials with the anti-malarial at- atabrine. Atabrine. That's right. After the war, he turned his research to malaria. Investigating conditions required to grow the parasites in culture began to work with the bird parasite, right. low fury, low fury, and ducks. Moved to the Rockefeller Institute right. in 1950, where he would work until his retirement. He did some electron microscopy, and of course, he figured out what Dixon. Well, he figured out how to grow Plasmodium falciparum, but not without the help of a colleague, and his name was Jim Jensen. Jim Jensen. 
And uh, it turned out that Plasmodium falciparum requires anaerobic conditions in order to grow. And stasis, not moving blood, but static conditions. And they didn't discover that until Jim Jensen suggested one day, well, why don't we try a, a candle jar? Put the cultures inside the candle jar, which they use to grow anaerobes like uh, Clostridium and those kinds of organisms. And um, Traeger looked at him like, he remembers the day. He says, do you really think that might work? <laughs> you know, he was willing to try anything. So yeah, and he did try everything except that. And the moment they tried it, the next day they came back. And, of course, the cultures were surviving. And the two weeks later, they had uh, macro and micro gametocytes inside the cultures. All the red cells were used up. Parasites were all over the place. Was that an important discovery? It was extremely important because the, now they could use an in vitro drug screening system to see if that was a resistant or a, or a mm -hmm. susceptible strain to chloroquine and other drugs as Did well. Did you get any awards? As they were result? nominated for the Nobel Prize, both of them. Wow. They did not get to the final stage of the of the awards, but uh, they were in the running for it, and that was a big one. Dr. Bill Traeger, he got lots of awards. You beat him? I not only met him, I saw him every day that I was there for three years. He was a wonderful, kind, loving father, had two sons, I think two sons and a daughter. Uh, his wife uh, uh, was a wonderful host. Many, many parties were held over at their house up in Westchester. They invited lots of uh, visiting firemen and stuff like this. 94 years old. Yeah, he was a fantastic. He died in 2005. He probably he's, died at his bench. He, he went to work. No, he died at, at home. Well, he, he worked almost every day of his life. He had a heart attack. But his obituary was written by <clears throat> Donald McNeil for the Times. Look at that. I knew he him. died on Saturday in his home in Manhattan. Wow. And his wife preceded him in her death, unfortunately. And uh, One of his sons is a scientist, works on nematodes out in um, British Columbia, I think at um, Simon Fraser University. Hmm. I got to know him a little bit when he came in to visit. All right. And, uh, wonderful. Very man. good. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right. Well, Dixon, what's next? You mean... Terms of another hero? No, in their show. Oh, I, I think we need another case. <laughs> we do. Daniel, do we have, have another case? Have you run case? out of cases or do you have any more? You'll never run out. <laughs> no, you know, this was a case that I was going to discuss last time, but it got postponed a little. And uh, it, we will now, uh, I'm going to go through this a little slowly because I'm hoping a little bit dialogue from, from you guys. Or not. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> so um, for all our listeners, this is a case of a 12-year-old uh, male living in a refugee camp uh, after fleeing war, a war-ravaged part of the Sudan. And he uh, mm. he presents to the, the caregivers there. It's actually um, the physician with a history of fever that was going on for many months. Um he also reports abdominal pain, sort of a chronic, chronic abdominal pain. When asked a little bit more about the fever, uh, he, he subjectively has a fever every other day. Um, mm. So the, initially when they interact with him, uh, he's in this area, they say, well, let's, you know, let's try anti-malarials. Um, doesn't get any better. So then they say, oh, well, we've got some broad spectrum antibiotic. Let, let's try that. So they put him on an antibiotic regimen. Again, he's not getting any better. Um, so they really decide let's let's focus a little bit more so they they're looking at the child um the exam um the heart rate's a little bit fast the lungs are clear but what they note on exam is he has an enlarged liver and he has an enlarged palpable spleen um to give some context here sort of pause for a second but the camp has very limited resources so they can't they can't do any further diagnostic tests um I was talking to the physician who was caring for him, and, and he says, you know, there's several children with very similar presentations, and um, mm. a number of them have died already. And so the physician um, says, you know, I, I, haven't, I have an idea in my head what I think this is, um, not able to get any diagnostic testing from the local NGO that is somewhat helping and supporting the clinic. Um, but they are willing to give him um, medications to try an empiric trial of um, – intravenous amphotericin. So he, they go ahead and they give this, um, this boy um, 10 days of intravenous amphotericin. 
um, the child improves and they actually go on then to um, treat a number of other children with similar presentation. They also go on to improve and do well. And so we're left with this sort of, you know, what do, what do we think um, this child is being treated for? Mm. Right. Dixon got it already. Well, I wrote the book with him, remember. Do you have any <laughs> questions to help illuminate this? No, if I did, I would just be giving it away. So I'm just going to shut up. This child is living in a refugee camp without his parents, right? True. He has lost his parents. His parents mm-hmm. probably died from something And else. there are lots of other kids in this refugee camp, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's the challenge here is they, they've seen several of these um, um, young men come in with this similar presentation. Several of them have ended up dying. So they finally said, you know what, we really need to do something here. Mm-hmm. I know we don't have any diagnostic tests, but, you know, if this boy follows the path of the others, um, you know, that's not great. So let's let's undertake um, this therapeutic trial. Correct. And these camps are open air, right? They are. And so they have lots of bugs flying yeah, around and biting conditions. them multiple yeah. times, right? Har- horrible conditions. And they're not fed very well. No. Nope. No. Hmm. That's right. So he, they saved his life so he could live under horrible conditions, right? Well, you never know when the camps will break up and they'll be dispersed right. back to their home countries, but that really happens. So. No, actually, that's a, that is an ex- excellent point you make, um, which is that, uh, and there recently is a book that uh, came out that I have on my list uh, right after I read Bit and to read, but it's all ab- it's all about the refugee crisis, and it is amazing that this um, some areas like these refugee camps in the South Sudan have transformed from what people had hoped would be a temporary solution into permanent living conditions for so many. Um, right. You know, I, w- I want to say millions, but we're getting close to billions. I mean, it's amazing what percentage of our world's population is living um, in these type of situations. Yeah, it's it's awful. Yeah. Awful. Yeah, well, here we live properly. We think this is the norm, but it's not. No, it's not. No, no. No, definitely we're not. We're very lucky. We're very fortunate. This is true. All right, there you go. That's our case. We have just two letters, so let's read them. John sends in an article. <clears throat> says uh, spotted while spotted this. <clears throat> sorry, sorry to do this to you. Spotted this while reading the news from home and thought it might be of some interest. I appreciate it's not from a peer-reviewed journal, but a curious emergence nonetheless. <laughs> it's from hmm. it's from CBC. It's Canadian news. Oh. Tapeworm and coyotes that can cause fatal tumors in people has spread all over Alberta. Right. I have to th- see what Daniel thinks of this. This is a Kinococcus multilocularis, very right. common in wildlife in Western Canada. Yeah. Um, can make people seriously ill and even kill them. True. It's from New England Journal. Very difficult to diagnose in people. Yeah, and it's it's a difficult disease because it's different than the other kinococcus uh, granulosis that we're most familiar with, where you actually get these particular defined cysts. This is like a spreading membrane that tends exactly. to invade through structures. It's a horrific disease. Weird. It says your liver becomes infiltrated by tumor-like lesions. That's right. Yeah, these just yeah these sort of membranes that are invading mm. through. Exactly. Uh, is this treatable? Um, not, not, not easily. It's, um, surgically maybe, um, yeah, it's not, not a great, not a great disease. So the wildlife is highly infected and that's how it can yes. spread to people. Yeah. Is that another indication of global climate change? And the answer might be yes, because it's longer growing seasons and therefore the vole population can expand. Hmm. When that happens, it can exceed the predation from snowy owls and lynx. And that's where the coyotes come in. So continuing, uh, John writes, I really enjoy your program. Thanks for making it broad enough that those with a limited biology background might enjoy it. John is from Quitre, Panama. Wow. I don't even know where that is. What part of Panama is that? I was about to ask you where that was. (laughs) You got some familiarity with that area. C-H-I-T-R-E. Quitre. Is in um, well, it's in Panama. Mm. It <laughs> seems to be on the east coast. East. No, it's the west coast. Okay, and what what area? All right, it's it's it's, it's due east of Santiago, south of the canal. 
I I don't know. It's uh, kind of southwest of Panama City. Hmm. It's on the Pacific side, hmm. but it's in that Bay Area. Hmm. Where have you been there, Daniel? So I, I when I tend to go down, I go on a pretty regular basis now. I, I fly in and out of Panama City, mm-hmm. but then I go up to the Bocas del Toro um, archipelago area, right. which is right. the northeast by the Costa Rican border. Oh, I see that. Oh, this is far away from that. Hmm. Yeah. So that actually the next time I go back is when you guys will um, maybe be teaching in, in Malta. It's the same week. Is it really? And yeah, in March of 2020. <laughs> oh, wow. Somehow everyone wants to do teaching of CME during that week in March. <laughs> Can you take the sure. investment, Dixon? Uh, Natasha writes, just listened to episode 168 and heard the suggestion from a listener about having another interview with Peter Hotez. That sounds great. I heard one interview with him and you all did quite a while back and it was great. I love your podcast, but I think it would be nice to see more interviews with researchers and discussions and explanations of parasite infections. You guys do a great job of making medical and scientific discussion accessible, interesting, and fun for any kind of listeners. My friends and I, with animal husbandry experience, love to listen to TWIP on road trips. (laughs) We always learn so much and and are well entertained. Um, Well, thanks very much for the compliments. And um, yeah, it's a good idea. We'd like to get more researchers and more in-depth discussions. Perhaps we should start featuring some of them on our show that wrote papers that we reviewed like we do on TWIV. We do that occasionally. We do. We do. Yes, we do. And Peter, I'm sure we'd be glad to be on again. Yeah, right. We'll get Peter on. Yeah, he's a a loquacious and intelligent and uh, entertaining speaker. He's also a good speaker. I meant to say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's TWIP 174. If you listen, we'd appreciate if you subscribed and not just did a one-off here and there, you know. Press the subscribe button. It doesn't cost you anything. And you get every episode. And we know how many people are listening. That's important to us for reasons I don't have time to explain, but <laughs> it's really important to us. If you really like what we do, consider contributing financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have ways where you could send us a dollar a month automatically. And for you, that's not a lot of money. It would give you amazing science, not just TWIP, but TWIV and TWIM and TWIVO and Immune. All great science podcasts by different cadres of scientists, actual scientists who try to explain to you what we're doing. And um, it helps us. A buck a month from each of you out there would really help us. So microbe.tv slash contribute. And of course, if you're going to guess about the cases, please make an informed guess and send it to twip at microbe.tv. Or you could do a one-word guess if you'd like. (laughs) And uh, if you haven't won a book, we'll put you in the running. Daniel Griffin's at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and ParasitesWithoutBorders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, a pleasure. Thank you. Dixon de Pommier's at Trichinella.org, TheLivingRiver.org. Thanks, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank Ronald Jenkins for his music and ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.